Briscoe, one of the instructors here at the St. Louis Chess Club, here for Openings Explained, and I am excited for this one. Uh, tonight we're going to be going over the decline variation of the Nimzovich defense. Uh, probably the most popular response to the Nimzovich defense by those players who know what they're doing. Um, I will fully admit, a couple weeks ago before I was preparing this lecture, uh, when I saw the Nimzovich defense, I really was just like, all right, I'm going to take the center and play principles. Um, but when I had to prepare this lecture, I realized there are much better options for white, and we're going to be covering those tonight. So let's go to the board. And the Nimzovich defense uh, comes after 1e4 and 2, or sorry, I guess black's move, uh, 1 knight c6. Uh, and we're going to talk about this move, uh, just this position for a little bit here, and kind of talk about what is happening. Uh, so here, white has played pawn to e4, claiming some space in the center, occupying with the pawn, and really just trying to take control. Uh, I don't feel like I need to explain e4 more than that. Um, but here, with black's first move, knight to c6, uh, you might see this a lot, probably around yeah, 12, 1400 level. I see it a lot there. Um, and here, it looks like it's a good move. It looks like you're developing a piece. It looks like you're controlling the center. But this actually is not the case. Uh, if white wanted to, they can just play pawn to d4 anyways. And um, this can be kind of what black hopes for. Um, playing d4 is very principled. You know, if your opponent gives you the center, take it. Uh, but I want to talk about why this may cause a problem. And I believe the move here is actually e5. And after e5, Black is telling white, you need to make a decision. How are you going to handle the center here? And there are a couple options, some good, some not so good. Um, but white can choose to take, they can choose to push, they can try and defend with pawn to c3. But no matter what option white takes, they're going to have to commit their central structure, um, which gives black a solid plan for what to do next. Um, so while those positions can be good, here tonight, I'm going to be recommending the move knight to f3. And this is the, the declined variation of the Nimzovich defense. Here, we are just uh, adding some reinforcements to the squares that black has decided they want to take control of. And here, funny enough, um, the best move is probably not e6. Whoops. Um, the best move here is probably just playing pawn to e5 and transpose to a normal king's pawn opening, um, where white has the option to play bishop b5, bishop c4, pawn to d4, uh, more of your standard classical chess. So for the sake of tonight's lecture, we're not going to look at pawn to e5. We're going to be looking at the other options that black has, because we are, after all, looking at the Nimzovich defense. We're not going to be looking at any of the king's knight openings. Um, I do want to mention that this opening does have a lot of transpositions in it. So if you're looking as black to, uh, I guess, get some position you want in a different move order, try and psych out your opponents, this might be a defense to look at. And for the white player, you really do want to know a lot of your lines because this can transpose to many different openings. Uh, you have uh, something that resembles the Scandinavian. You have a line in the Tarash French. You have lines like the Peartz. Uh, or at least lines that resemble those structures. So you do want to make sure you're familiar with those. But let's get right into it. I think first we're going to start off with pawn to d5. And after pawn to d5, uh, this is where we get kind of a transposition to a Scandinavian. I don't believe it's a true Scandinavian, but the structures are the same. So white should handle it uh, very similarly. They take on d5. And now black takes with the queen. And what do you do in the Scandinavian here? You just play knight to c3, getting a tempo off of the queen. If you're black, the queen must move. Otherwise, you're just going to lose a queen. And again, just like the Scandinavian, the most popular move here is queen to a5. After queen to a5, the queen just moves to the edge of the board, uh, tries to get to some safety. Now, one of the main differences between here in the Nimzovich defense and the uh, Scandinavian is that your knight on c6 blocks your pawn on c7. So you can no longer play pawn to c6, creating, an, uh, I guess, an escape route for your queen. Um, this can lead to some problems. If black isn't careful, their queen can get trapped. 
Normally in this position, white will play bishop to b5, pinning the knight on c6. Black is just simply going to break the pin. White castles. And now black will play pawn to a6, hitting the bishop. They want to get this bishop out of there, maybe castle queen side, but try and give white problems along the way. So here, what should white do with this bishop? Uh, some people may think dropping back to a4 is fine. After all, it is protected by the knight. Some may say go back to c4 and hit the potentially weak f7 square. Uh, but I'm going to recommend taking on c6. Nick, why are you doing this? You're giving away the bishop pair. Well, it's going to come down to development overall. After bishop retakes, you get pawn to d4, you again have this center, and two knights can arguably be more developed than a queen and bishop. And if you really want the determining factor, white is castled here. So white is up in development. Um, moves like knight e5 will come in the future. Black does have two options here that have been played in actual games. Uh, the first option is castles long. So we have knight to e5 hitting the bishop and the f7 pawn. The bishop drops to e8 to protect it. Now bishop to e3 solidifying your center. There is pressure from the rook. And here it's really hard to find the best move for black. Um, Computer best move is knight h6, uh, but what has been played in actual games is pawn to f6. Uh, I believe in the MCO uh, 15th edition, they marked that uh, the knight should go to d3. And if the knight goes to d3, this position is equal. It is balanced. But uh, I'm going to give the chat a couple seconds here to see if they can find the best move, one that can lead to a very strong advantage, possibly even winning. So we'll give, give white, um, I guess give the chat moves to find, time to find a move for white. Uh, can't talk tonight. <laughs> Jonathan Bernhard, queen f3, exclam. Okay, I like the idea. I like the idea. Um, so queen to f3 and probably hitting upon an idea that's going to pop up very shortly. Um, so after queen to f3, the idea is that uh, if black takes, you can take on f8. And then most of black's pieces are pinned. You're threatening to take on g8. Uh, and black is going to have a really hard time developing here. Uh, however, e takes d4, you can't really take back, it's not going to be as fun. I guess you can take with the bishop here, um, but bishop c6, your queen's starting to get hit. If you take on g7, uh, knight to f6 should be winning for black uh, because the rooks are going to come to g8, and then the rook is going to threaten to take on g2. So this can be a pretty interesting position. I guess the queen can come to f4 if you want to be safe, but... Uh, this position is probably going to be equal because black is able to develop the bishop. So we'll go back to, uh, what is it here, when the queen is still on d1 after f6. We have Pietro and a couple other people saying knight to c4. Um, knight to c4 also can be equal, probably favors black a little bit more after queen to h5. Um, just the queen is safe here, offering a trade. Uh, white can decline the trade with queen to e1, but now black can kind of break in the center with e5 and get uh, more play than we want to give them. So again, we'll go back, see if anyone can find the absolute best move. All right. Uh, we see pawn to f4. I'm not really sure what the idea is with pawn to f4 because after the pawn takes and you take back with the f pawn, uh, you can go knight h6 and the bishop is defended by the rook. So no discovery here. Um, pawn to f4 is just losing for white. Um, back to the idea of queen f3. This definitely was a little bit chaotic, uh, but black got a little bit of play here. And that is mainly because in the line that we went over, 
uh, when you take after bishop to c6, this rook on d8 is protected by the king. So in order to get the most we can out of this position, we're actually going to go queen to g4 checking first. And the idea is that after the king goes to b8, now we have queen f3. And then if they take, we take on f8. And now the position is winning for white because this rook is not defended anymore. Uh, with this rook undefended, all the pieces really are pinned. There is no bishop to c6 because of queen d8 check. So queen to g4 is really going to uh, hurt black. So with that position being shown, black does not want to take on e5. Um, so the best move for them here is probably e6. Uh, but after e6, we have pawn to a3. And now you're threatening moves like pawn to b4, just attacking the queen. And white is just going to have an overall better position because of their space and because they're able to tempo the queen a lot. Um, so let's see, the move here, knight h6, pawn to b4, queen to b6. And now here, there's the move d5, a discovery on the queen. I think you guys are getting the idea here. This queen it just cannot find a safe square. Queen to d6, knight to c4, attacking it again. Queen to d7, and rook f to d1 will finish white's development where black still has four pieces on the back row. This knight is on the edge of the board. Black is not having a great time here. OK, um, so that's going to be the main idea of this uh, Scandinavian line in the Nimzovich. Can't really find anything much better. Uh, the only other alternative here that's worth a try is instead of castles queenside, uh, they play e6 which, you know, they don't have to castle queenside now. They can try to do their best to develop their pieces and castle kingside. Here, um, white will not get this crazy uh, advantage that they had in the other line where they castled first. Here it's going to be a bit more equal. White is going to have a slight advantage. They're going to be better. Um, but this is actually worth a try for black. You'll see that uh, they give up a little bit of integrity in their queenside pawn structure but they're going to have a safer king overall and actually be able to develop their pieces. And uh, just illustrative moves here. Um, nothing too crazy. When the queen goes to f3, it's hitting the c6 pawn, so the knight has to go to e7 instead of f6. Uh, knight to e4 is just centralizing the knight, getting on the bishop. Black offers a queen trade, and really the only thing for white to watch out for here is make sure they don't trade the queens. If they trade the queens, then it's going to go into an end game, which doesn't necessarily favor white. Yes, black, uh, black has these doubled c pawns, um, but they don't have a light square bishop to get the c6 pawn, um, and their dark square bishop is contested by black's dark square bishop. Okay, back to... Move two. So that was our first kind of transposition into kind of a Scandinavian. It's a worse Scandinavian for black, so I do not recommend uh, that black plays this looking for a Scandi. Um, one of the other moves here, probably one of the other big transpositions, is e6. And I faced this in a game just last week on chess.com. And uh, this was like the only line I didn't prep, uh, so I figured I had to include it tonight. Um, so pawn e6, and this is going to transpose into a French defense, uh, specifically uh, Guimard's line in the Tarash variation. Now, me, I'm a classical French guy. I don't play any Tarash stuff. So <laughs> this game uh, was very foreign to me, the, the ideas here. Um, here you do go d4. Because black has already played e6, they can't, you know, if they go e5, they just kind of burn a tempo. And now after pawn to d5, uh, like the best square for the knight is like back to b8. Um, it's not going to be great for black undeveloping like this. So white can get away with d4, and black should go pawn to d5. Uh, here there are a few different ideas, but the most played move is knight b to d2. And here you're going to see um, the knight goes to d2. That way the pawn can go to c3 and protect d4. And then bishop might come to d3, might go to b5, uh, could just go to e2, and then white is going to castle king side. Um, but here's the main line here. After knight f6, pawn to e5, 
knight d7, standard maneuver in the Steinitz variation. Uh, if they try and go knight to e4, um, then white just goes c3 and they have a better position, almost plus two. Um, the one thing that white should not do is take on e4. This can be terrible because after the pawn takes, this knight has to move. Best square is g5, but this pawn on d4 is going to fall after queen takes and after the queen trade. Uh, there's no guarantee this position is good for white. Um, black is about uh, black is about plus one and a half here. So as long as white just remembers protect on d4 with c3, don't trade on e4 too early. They should be fine. And now here we go into probably the best move uh, right away is pawn to d6. If your opponent is playing the Nimzovich defense and they're not wanting a transposition, this is going to be the main move they play. They play pawn to d6, and this is the Williams variation. Um, I guess someone was asking in the Tarash variation after c3, what if they go f6? Uh, give me a moment. I will pull that line back up. Do there, e6. We go through after c3, pawn to f6. You can probably just take, and I'm not sure you know, what way black is going to take back. Makes sense to go with the knight. Um, queen looks like it may also be OK, but I mean, you could just take it no matter what way black takes back. Bishop can go to d3, and you're going to castle king side, and you'll have, have a fine position. Um, Stockfish 13 is giving this an evaluation of plus 1.6 for white. Uh, so I guess the line you're wanting is knight takes f6. Like I said, just bishop d3. Still don't know what black is doing. Um, they can try bishop d6, try and develop and castle. Both sides get the castle. And then rook e1. This knight can go to f3 and g3 or e3. This bishop can get out to g5, pin the knight. I mean, there's... There's just easy development for white, many options. Um, and here, the, I guess one of the reasons why uh, this is a worse French is with the knight on c6, you don't get this c5 break that you get in most Frenches. So hopefully that should answer DM's question. Now back to d6. Like I said, this is going to be the main stuff. And here, after pawn to d6, um, we're going to go pawn to d4. Again, black has now announced, you know, okay, I'm not going to just strike right away and force you to commit. Um, black has already committed to uh, either d6, e6, or d6, e5, uh, which we'll actually look into right now after pawn to e5. After pawn to e5, uh, this is a transposition into the Philidor defense. Um, so I have a, a friend who's an expert who plays this transposition a lot. Um, trying to catch, catch e4 players off guard. Um, white has nothing to fear. They can just go into a slightly better end game after d takes. And now the main move is knight takes. If pawn takes, this is a bit dubious. Um, black, or sorry, white can just trade queens and the king should take. If the knight takes, you're just undeveloping. You're hanging this pawn in the center. So, so the king really does need to take here. And then white can just play bishop c4 and just enjoy that first move advantage in the end game. Um, so after a pawn takes, if knight takes, uh, just trade the knights. Again, go into this end game where you might be slightly better because you have this first move advantage. That's, that's what white's going to be counting on uh, in this line. So that was the little transposition to the Philidor. If they don't want to transpose to a Philidor, then you're probably going to see knight to f6. All right, uh, knight to f6 here. Uh, I guess someone was saying pawn d5 in some line was OK. Um, but I don't know what move that they are suggesting it. So I'm going to keep going through this main line, um, knight to f6. And this position is going to resemble a Peart's. A uh, Pierce defense because they have the pawn on d6, the knight is on f6, 
One idea you might see is pawn to g6 and a fianchetto, like a regular pierce. Uh, but this knight is on c6, where normally in the pierce you'll see the knight go to a6, pawn probably playing to c5, and then that knight is going to reroute in the future. Uh, let's see, that d5 comment earlier was saying as 3e5. Uh, yes, yes, advancing the pawn should also be fine. Um, but I think uh, most tried and tested, at least at the top level, is going to be trading going into that end game. Okay, after knight f6, there's a couple things that white needs to think about. Uh, mainly, this knight attacking this hanging pawn on e4. What is the best way for white to defend this? Do they go knight to c3? Do they go knight d2? Do they go bishop d3? Can they try and get away with pushing? Uh, do they go queen e2, the other knight to d2? I mean, what is the best move? Obviously, not all those moves are good, um, but the best move here is probably going to be knight to c3. Another good try is bishop to d3, um, just developing the bishop, getting ready to castle right away. Um, but knight to c3 is the move that I've chosen to cover tonight where the most common response from black is bishop to g4. And the idea behind this move is uh, very simple. Just pin the knight. You're going to try and uh, take d4. So if white just tries to play pawn to h3, then bishop h3, and if they mess up and play queen takes f3, they just hang their center pawn. So there is a little trick here, um, but one that white shouldn't have to worry about too much. Uh, all white needs to do to counter this is develop their other bishop to e3. Just reinforce d4, overprotect your center, um, and you will be fine. Bishop e2 is also a good idea. Um, that was suggested by I, Manny in the chat here. Um, after bishop to e2, though, what I don't like is that this bishop on e2 is a little passive. Um, there's no guarantee that black is going to take on f3. Um, so, you know, even after if they take and take, um, your bishop's going to be looking kind of like a tall pawn. This diagonal is probably not the best. I would much rather try and develop the bishop somewhere where it can have more influence over the game. Uh, probably c4, looking at f7. Uh, again, you can go to d3, and then after an eventual e5, it will have this long diagonal to work with. Um, you know, bishop e2, not blundering. White still is going to have that first move advantage. Um, but I do prefer bishop to e3, just because we don't know the best square for this light square bishop yet. And here we re reach a uh, position where black has a couple different options here. Um, first, we'll cover probably, I don't want to say worst, because that really makes it sound bad, but um, g6 seems natural, where um, after g6, you know, a normal Pierce player might think this position is fine, but already white can give some serious pressure. You know, pawn to h3, hitting the bishop. And now after this pawn has been played to g6, they cannot retreat to h5. Uh, because if they go back to h5, pawn to g4 traps the bishop, and white is going to win a piece. So, that leaves black with really only one option. They have to take on f3. If black plays some other move, like uh, after h3 and they go back to d7, um, you know, this could be a way to play, but why, why is black putting their bishop on g4 if, uh, you know, they're going to go back to d7? Ideally, black would have prepped this before they play it, and they would see that if they try and go g6, white does have h3. Going back to d7 is just too passive, really allows white to open up the center with e5, um, and then just the piece development is better. Uh, White will have a, a mo much more comfortable position here. Computer says they're winning. Um, I think it's too early in the game to practically say White's going to win every time, but White will have a better game. Uh, so yeah, they had to take on f3. Now the queen is able to take on f3 because you overprotected your center, so there is no more knight takes d4. Black can continue with natural development. Bishop to g7 looking to castle. Uh, but here, white castles queenside, and this is a very common idea you will see um, where if one side's trying to castle, um, the side which is develops is going to castle on the opposite side so they can throw all their pawns towards the enemy king. 
this idea is very common in like the Yugoslav dragon. Um, so, and uh, pretty much any opening where there's this Fianchetto structure, uh, launching your pawn, specifically h4, h5, is normally a strong idea. We'll see black castle, pawn to g4, pawn to e5, trying to get in the center, but black has waited just too long to play this. They can just take on e5. Note that the pawn cannot take back because it will hang the queen. So they have to take with the knight. After the knight takes back, White just moves the queen out of the danger. Um, black makes a move like rook e8. And now white gets pawn to f4. And these pawns on the king side are just going to come way faster than any possible advance black is going to have. Uh, black has really just waited too long to get into this game. And white is going to steamroll on the king side. You see like knight e to d7. You see pawn to e5 just breaking a temporary. Um, pawn sacrifice, this is really just to block the rook from having any influence on the game because uh, this bishop can hang in some lines. Uh, but now you'll see pawn to f5 and this pawn on e5 is just blocking the rook. kind of makes the rook f to e8 look a little silly. Uh, queen to e7, g5 hitting the knight, the knight moves and here after pawn f6 white is already getting a material advantage. And this was played in the game uh, Rizzo done uh, back in 2011, uh, where after knight takes, um, here white's already up a piece, but I'll show the end of this game just to show how quickly it can end. Bishop c4 hitting f7, a rook might come to f1, adding pressure to the f file. So knight f4 blocking it off, queen e4 getting to safety, pawn to c6 just trying to save these pawns, but after rook d7, um, you know, white is going to be ready to take on f7. After rook to f8, defending it, now there's bishop to c5 hitting the rook, and if the rook doesn't move, then um, you'll, you'll see how it ends here is uh, bishop to e7, and black resigns because the queen is actually uh, being trapped here. So g6, probably not the way to go. Uh, let's see, what is another try for black? I think the most popular here is pawn to e6, adopting a small center approach. Black has already developed the bishop outside of the chain, um, so now they're able to play e6. Kind of getting uh, prepared for either pawn break white may have. Uh, here, the main line is pawn to h3, hitting the bishop, and now here, uh, the bishop can go to h5 because this pawn was not played to g6. So after bishop to h5, now white has a decision to make. Do they play d5? Do they play e5? Uh, and probably the best move here is d5. You have this bishop on the dark squares. It's not really looking at too much here, but you want to maximize its potential um, covering the entire board. So you play d5, clearing out this bishop. This bishop's ready to come to the queen side in the future. Uh, after pawn takes, pawn takes, and here we see an intermezzo from black. They take on f3 first, and this is just to gain time. Because after queen recaptures, there's knight e5 hitting the queen again. So that is the point of bishop takes f3. The queen can just drop back to e2. Um, you might question why it's blocking the bishop here, um, but white is going to play g4 probably bring the bishop to g2 where it can help support this d5 pawn. We see pawn to a6 and the reason for this is that if this rook moves at all we don't want the bishop to snipe that pawn. White will castle queenside, bishop to e7 developing, pawn to f4, tempo on the knight so the knight has to move, and then pawn to g4 and white has a better position here due to the space advantage, and this position was reached in Golubev uh, versus Markowski. White ended up winning that game, uh, BL 1995. So E6, um, again, nice try, small center, but still a little too passive. Okay, uh, I Manny's asking about F4. Uh, where? Where in the game for f4? Um, probably f4 after a6. 
Um, just a note to the viewers in the chat, um, it helps a lot more if you put a move number next to your suggestions. Um, but I'm going to assume that I am Annie's asking about why not F4 after A6? And the main idea, you know, F4 is still great. F4 is still a winning move. Uh, just hitting the knight, the knight can move. Um, but you really want to start, you know, making sure your own king is safe, all of your pieces are developed before you start launching an attack. It would be a little awkward to go for this attack and then have to be like, okay, I've attacked you, but I need to make sure I'm safe, and then I'm going to go back to attacking you. Uh, there's a more, or I guess there's a better flow if you have a, a continuous plan of I'm going to, you know, make sure I'm safe and then go for the attack. Okay, that covers e6 again, probably a little too passive. And then we're going to get into what I believe is the best practical try for black. If you're trying to play the Nimzovich defense, this is probably going to be what you're going for in a game. Uh, e5, not the most popular move, but uh, it's probably the best practical try again. Okay, what does white do here after pawn to e5? That is the question that black is asking. They are contesting the center. They're not leaving it up to white to decide what pawn break they're going to get. Black is saying, hey, I'm, I'm getting the center here. I'm going to trade if you let me um, try and get my bishop and castle. I'm in this game too. Uh, there's a couple moves here for white, um, but there's two, two big ones that I want to talk about. Um, Eli Musa in the chat is suggesting pawn to d5, and this is one of the two major um, options white can play. Pawn to d5, just hitting the knight right away. And this is fine, but I believe that this position is going to uh, not give white everything they can have, um, going to lead to more of an equal position. And I will show um, the line from Min Hazudin versus uh, Aid. It was uh, White ended up winning this game in County Mansisk of 2010. Um, but the position that we get is actually equal, and White ended up winning, I believe, because of just a big ELO gap. Um, the other move is Bishop to b5, and I will be covering that after this d5 line. I'm Annie, so I'm Annie suggested Bishop to b5. Uh, that is the other move. After pawn to d5, the knight just goes to e7. It has to move out of danger. It's looking to come to g6 and possibly hop on f4. Pawn to h3 will just get a tempo off the bishop right away. The bishop goes back to d7. Here, um, black doesn't have to take because there is no pressure on d4 anymore. It's not like black is going to get anything out of it. Probably is better just to save the bishop. Um, keep it on the board, use it to build complications later, and most likely help with a c6 break. We see bishop to e2, knight to g6, again, looking to come to f4, and here, pawn to g3, just stopping this knight from coming to f4, h4. We see bishop to e7, black is trying to castle now, and pawn to h4, the reason we have this move is if white is wanting to castle kingside, they cannot leave their h-pawn hanging. This bishop is on d7. It is eyeing the pawn, so they have to move it out of the way. Pawn to h6, um, just, I guess, creating a square for this knight to reroute itself in the future. Um, but honestly, this move is a little unclear to me. Uh, and pawn h5, the knight goes to f8. There is no other square for it to go to. Knight to h4, looking to come to f5. Uh, maybe there's tactics in the future on g6, but that's going to be way down the line. Um, and then we see pawn to c6. So this is the break that black is going to try and go for, try and break up white center. And this is kind of an idea that you'll see in the French. So we actually earlier talked about black playing f6 in that Tarash transposition line. Um, where white can just take. Here, white doesn't take. Um, they just develop. They play like knight f5. And queen c8 trying to take on f5 and win a pawn. So white just defends with g4. They do not want to take on e7. Um, 
this is still going to be good, but the idea of not taking on e7 is just because this knight is really hurting black's position, really cramping it. Um, and after g4, you just retain a space advantage. Um, this bishop on e7 is doing nothing, really. Uh, bishop takes, e-pawn takes, knight to h7, can come to g5. Uh, queen to d2, pawn to c5, f4. Uh, after takes, if bishop takes, you're hitting d6, adding pressure. Um, someone's asking, why not take the pawn on g7? So after taking on g7, uh, it looks like uh, actually all this is winning. I believe what happened is um, white may have missed an opportunity in this game. Um, looks like they played g4. But yes, taking on g7 uh, is the best move. Uh, why, why they didn't play this, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm not one of the masters who played this game. Um, but let's see, back to our position. Uh, bishop to b5 pinning, trading, again, hitting d6, and this position is equal. So with that comment, uh, let me see what is going on with black here. So queen c8 is the problem. Maybe white just missed it. It looks like if they want to keep equality, bishop takes f5, ef5, um, and then cd5. And there's a check that white can give. Uh, black blocks it with the knight. But this position is actually reading as very slightly better for black. So I think this is actually an error on my part. I think I overlooked this. Um, and uh, this is why I'm glad we have the live chat fix these errors as they happen. Don't have to respond to those nasty YouTube comments in the future. Um, but yes, um, it looks like g4 is, uh, or the queen c8 rather, is the blunder. Um, they do need to take on f5. So that is a good way for, for black to kind of get a little bit of an edge against this d5 line. Okay, um, let's see. And it looks like the last big line is after e5. So we just went over d5. Um, uh, chat caught my mistake with queen c8. Um, and black does have an equal position after bishop f5. I think the best move here is going to be bishop to b5. Uh, after bishop to b5, you're pinning the knight, immediately threatening to play d5 and try and win a piece. So we see knight to d7 breaking this pin. It doesn't really make much sense for the bishop to go to d7. Uh, you're kind of just undeveloping, and black is giving up this pin that they had, uh, where this knight is putting pressure on e5. Um, so actually, white could exploit this right away by taking on c6 if bishop takes. Um, it looks like queen to d3 to protect the pawn first, but uh, now after you know trading in the center, um, white has more development. Uh, you know, two knights and a bishop and a queen versus a bishop and a knight, and white is ready to castle. Uh, white just has a nice time advantage here. Uh, so knight to d7, and here pawn to d5 right away. Knight has to move. Best square is to undevelop, set up for the next game. And now pawn to h3. So in a lot of these lines with this pin on g4, you'll see white playing h3. This is something that they're trying to take care of. Um, bishop to h5, maintaining the pin. And now pawn to g4. You'll see white gaining space on the king side here. Bishop has to go to g6, don't want to hang a bishop. And now pawn to h4, pawn h5 to stop advancing. And here I'm actually going to take a pause and ask the chat what to play in this position because there are a lot of options for white. Um, some may be uh, good, some may be great, some may be not so good. So I want to see what the chat has here uh, as ideas. We'll cover those one by one. Looks like the chat is going on some adventure talking about the Sicilian. Unfortunately, there are no Sicilian transpositions with the knight on c6. Okay. Uh, our first suggestion is g5. 
and I really like this. This is the move that I recommend in this position. Pawn to g5. Now, what is the point with pawn to g5? Um, while you're trying to type the point of pawn to g5, I will cover the other move that was suggested, knight to g5. So knight to g5. This also looks pretty good, trying to get into black's position, but there's really no, no targets that you're hitting here. Yes, f7 is weak, um, I guess, in the long term, with the king being one of the defenders, but with the bishop on g6 and no way to kick the bishop, I find it very hard to um, justify this knight going to g5, though it's not a big problem. Uh, someone is suggesting bishop to g5. I do not like this move as much. After bishop to g5, black just blocks with the bishop, bishop to e7, and then after white takes, black takes back. Um, there's not much development left for black to do. They just need to get this knight off of b8. Um, maybe they castle, maybe they don't. Uh, let's say you play g5 here to stop them from taking on g4. Well, now black has pawn to c6. If you try taking, then the pawn's going to take back. You have to move your bishop. And now black has a better uh, pawn center. So don't really want to take. So you move your bishop back. And then here um, allows black to go knight b6. And the other knight is going to come to d7. And this is pretty equal position. Um, looks like uh, stockfish 13 saying slightly better for black. Um, but nothing too crazy. It's all all under uh, minus one half. So not a big fan of bishop to g5. I don't think that white with this space advantage should be looking to trade off pieces. And that's another general rule in chess. So for those of you who don't know, um, if one side has a space advantage, you don't want to trade off pieces. If you're the side who's cramped, you do want to trade off pieces. The reason for this is because if you know, you're cramped, you don't have a lot of squares for your pieces, well, the less pieces you have, then um, the less squares you need. So looks like there's no other big suggestions. So we'll look at g5, which again is the move I recommend. And the main point, I see some people saying that uh, pawn to g5 looks spicy. Um, I do not agree. This is probably the opposite of spicy, is you're actually locking up the position to make sure you retain this space advantage on the king side and in the center. And you can go like queen d2 or queen d3 and castle long. Um, again, with these other moves, like uh, knight g5, knight g5 was a good try. I will give credit there, um, because then the bishop does protect the pawn. Um, you do not want to trade. Uh, pawns here because after bishop takes h5 you have this pin again and it's again just annoying you have to go bishop to e2 this is undeveloping your piece something you want to try and avoid in the openings oh it wasn't a typo uh it wasn't spicy they were saying spacey got it got it wasn't a typo so yes g5 Spacey, I'll take it, I'll take it. Just keeping the space, locking it up. And then the way that this went in this game, um, this game was a uh, Pavasovic versus Mestrovic in 2002. Um, and it went bishop e7, knight to d2, pawn to c6, bishop to e2, you have to retreat your attacked piece. Knight to b6, again, we're seeing this idea where knight to b6, the other knight can come in. Knight to f1 is just a, a maneuver by white. Maybe go to g3 and f5, it's an idea, but actually white has different plans in this game. Um, so after cd5, the bishop takes on b6, and the reason for this um, is you're actually clearing out the e3 square for your knight. So after pawn takes back, um, you know, knight e3 is possible, but you are, you know, you, you do need to take back this pawn. And uh, I guess the last question I have for the chat here is what way does white take back this pawn? Um, it does have some significance on the position. You have three options. You have pawn takes, knight takes, and queen takes. Um, so this is an open question to the audience. Which recapture is the best?
there's another move which isn't recapturing, which um, is good. Bishop to b5, um, which after they block, then you can recapture. Um, let's see. What, what are the suggestions? Okay, we have Jonathan Bernhard saying queen takes. We have Garrett saying the knight takes. And then changing their mind to queen takes. Um, and Philippe is saying definitely not the pawn. Okay, so let's go through it one by one. We'll start with the pawn and why one might say definitely don't recapture with the pawn. After retaking with the pawn, this does open up the light square bishop. Uh, kind of makes me a little depressed that black is getting this much play. Um, just because, you know, you don't want to help your opponent if you can help it. So don't take with the pawn. You don't want to just let this diagonal open for your opponent. You can go knight takes, but if you try knight takes, bishop to e4. And then I'm not sure what white does here, probably just bishop f3, um, over protecting, um, protecting this attack on the rook, offering a trade. Um, but this trade after bishop to d5 and queen d5, knight to c6, protecting against the queen b7 threat. Uh, this position is a bit more equal. White has this um, slight advantage, but nothing to write home about. So that leaves us with the third option, and by process of elimination, we can almost say you can play queen takes without calculating, but we should um, if we want to make sure we're making good moves here. Queen to d5, and what is the point? The main idea is you leave this pawn on e4, this dark bishop um, is left on a closed diagonal. We want to make sure that black isn't getting any play. Uh, these pieces on the dark square diagonal here, those are shut out of play. Uh, black can castle, but the rook has no easy way to get to an open file. This rook is only staring at the a2 pawn, which is defended. Um, but here in the actual game that was played, um, white took with the e pawn and then um, ended up grinding an end game. But if you take with the queen, you're going to have a much easier time because black won't have more counterplay. So those are all of my, those are all my main suggestions for the Nimzovich defense. We will uh, leave the last bit of this time for any questions over any of the variations. Um, so again, if you're suggesting a move, please add move numbers. Makes it much easier to tell what you're talking about. Um, and yeah, questions. Jonathan just has this comment that um, d6 will remain weak and castles becomes an alternative. This is true. Um, this bishop on e7 does protect the, the d6 pawn, so it may not be as weak as you claim. Um, but yes, definitely with the queen on d5 and after castles long with the rook on d1, d6 is definitely a target. And you have moves like knight to b5, which can help um, put pressure. Uh, and black may be forced to give up this center pawn. Did we cover the Nimzovich Scandinavian variation? We did. We did. We covered that in the very beginning, where after uh, knight f3, they go d5. Any other questions? Are there any lines that we need to go over again? Making sure I didn't miss anything in my notes. I think that's it. So if we don't have any questions, we'll end this lecture a little early. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming in, uh, checking this out tonight. Uh, really good interaction. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, with me being the new instructor for Chess Openings Explained, uh, you know, if you do have openings you want to see covered, feel free to drop them in the comments section below. I'm always taking a look, getting your guys' suggestions. Uh, and who knows, if you ask early enough, you might get it featured. So, again, thanks everybody. I'll see you next week.
The St. Louis Chess Club is pleased to announce the expansion of our world-class chess facility. The 20,000 square foot expansion and upgraded facility will feature new ground level classrooms supporting players of all ages, as well as expanded tournament and community gathering spaces with state of the art technology. Accessibility upgrades, including a new three story elevator, will provide access for all participants and allow even greater community engagement in the great game of chess. As a proud resident of the Central West End neighborhood for over a decade, our hope is to build upon our investment into the community and solidify St. Louis as America's chess capital and preeminent global destination for lovers of the sport. We look forward to seeing you in our new space in 2021, when we will host the 2021 U.S. Chess Championships, 2021 U.S. Juniors and Senior Championships, the St. Field Cup, St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, and more.